All right, so this session today we'll be discussing uh, from the blogosphere to blogger knackle. Our two speakers today are Jenna Reese and Christine Haglin. Uh, let me pull out some of my things here. Jenna Reese is the acquisitions editor with Westminster John Knox Press and is a former religious religion book reviewer for the Publishers Weekly. Uh, she's the author of several books, including What Would Buffy Do? The Vampire Slayer as a Spiritual Guide. Uh, Mormonism for Dummies and Flunking Sainthood, A Year of Breaking the Sabbath, Forgetting to Pray and Still Loving My Neighbor. Uh, in October of 2009, she began tweeting the Bible, uh, summarizing a chapter in each tweet. And if you haven't been following that, you should follow it. It's a great way to get to take care of your daily, daily scripture study real quickly. Uh, Christine Hagland is the editor of Dialogue, a Journal of Mormon Thought, and a frequent commenter on many Mormon blogs. Uh, she's currently a, a perma blogger on the blog By Common Consent, which is live blogging this session right now, or this, this entire conference. Uh, she received her AB from Harvard in German Studies and her MA from the University of Michigan in German Literature. And according to her co-bloggers at By Common Consent, part of her presentation will be song and dance. So we'll need help moving the tables and chairs in a minute. So let's go ahead and get them. Get started. Well, thank you. You know, I hate to have it on my soul. I already have enough guilt as it is that that's his daily scripture study because that's wrong. That's just wrong. It's a humor project. It's the Bible now with 68% more humor than in the original version. But um, sometimes it's a little irreverent. I'm going to talk today about blogging and my life as a blogger in the last two years. I wanted to, instead of doing kind of a, a think piece about what it means that we have this democratization of information right now, which is a very exciting time as information is proceeding more relationally and horizontally than it is vertically. And as Mormons, this is quite a change for us. So I will talk about that a bit. But primarily, I'm going to be focusing on my own experiences. So I feel I should issue a qualification right at the outset that my experiences, results not typical, stamped on my forehead. This is just one person's journey. And you can take it or leave it. One voice in the Blogger Knackle Choir. And by the way, even though I've left the podium, I am not dancing. Boyd, yeah, it's enter and arrow space bar. No. Is this God's way of telling me I need to dance? <laughs> I hope not. That would be great. My lovely assistant, Vanna, will be here. OK, so the first thing I wanted to talk about is this fantastic conference that I went to almost exactly two years ago this week called Theology After Google, or TAG. And this is me speaking about the Twible, actually, which uh, I spoke about because it was a Twitter religion project. And so I wanted to, to sort of explore this idea of how do you use Twitter and other social media to create a community around religious questions. But I was so inspired by the whole event of TAG that I, <laughs> I did something a little bit radical. So this was the same time that Glenn Beck was talking about how people needed to make a mass exodus from quote unquote social justice churches. You may remember that, which I wasn't terribly happy about. I think I'm in that 73% from uh, Cooperman's presentation just a moment ago of Mormons who think that helping the poor is actually a good thing. And so inspired by some of the examples of what people who had spoken at the TAG conference were doing out in the world, I decided that morning in my hotel room, very jet lagged and waking up early, that I would just sit down and write a letter to Glenn Beck. And I wrote this, this fairly passionate open letter to Glenn Beck, and I sent it to a friend of mine who was an editor at BeliefNet, and told him, look, 
I would just like this to be posted. I don't need to be paid. I just feel very passionate and strongly about this issue, and I hope as a Mormon that we can have other voices to show that Mormonism isn't necessarily all about Glenn Beck's political views. And throughout the day, uh, we, I was getting emails from, from BeliefNet about what was going on with the traffic for this post because it did create quite a firestorm of controversy. Mostly the comments were people saying, who the heck are you? That would be the, the very polite Mormon version of that comment. And that I'd completely misunderstood what Glenn Beck was, was saying about social justice and about the government. And then there were some people who basically said right on, thank you for speaking as a Mormon to this issue. And then at the end of that day, I got an email from BeliefNet saying, the editors and I have been discussing this. We no longer have someone writing about Mormonism. Would you do that for us? And I said, great. I said, sure. So this is a part of the post, and I wanted to, I hadn't looked at it in a very long time, and I looked at it this week in preparation for this conference, and was amazed and kind of chagrined to see how passionate it really was. So here is a portion of what I wrote to Glenn Beck about feeding the hungry. It's not just a nice thing to do, or a civilized thing to do, or an optional thing to do. It is a commandment. And if I were you reading this passage, I'd be quaking in my tailor-made keds. Um, yeah, not a very nice thing to say. And it actually wasn't the meanest thing that I said in this blog post. The meanest thing was right off the bat when I said something about how if he was advocating exodus from social justice churches, that would mean he would have to leave ours. And if that happened, I would dance a little jig. <laughs> Thank you, but actually, I really had cause to repent of that statement because some of the things that people put in the comments were, how dare you say that about a brother in Christ? No matter what he has said, what gives you the right to, to vote someone out of the community of God? Which hit me very strongly. So this was an interesting way to begin blogging. Ready? And so we started this blog called Flunking Sainthood, which was the title of the book that I was finishing up that would be published in 2011. So this is now June of 2010 when I officially started blogging for BeliefNet. And I was to blog five times a week, contractually obligated to do that. Ready for the next one? I'm sorry this is, I'm sorry it's been a pain for you. Yet yeah, this one is, is going to basically command your time. So the plan was, first, that I would spend every Monday on Mormonism. They specifically wanted a Mormon blogger because they felt that they, they, it was an underrepresented religion on Mormonism, that, uh, on the site that actually got a lot of traffic. When they did post something about Mormonism, it turned out to be a pretty well-trafficked topic. But I didn't want to write about Mormonism more than once a week because I'm interested in a lot of different things and was interested also in bridging, you know, building bridges to other religious communities. So on Tuesdays, my plan was to have, oh, that's okay. So Tuesdays, the plan was to have a focus on technology, on digital publishing, some of these questions that uh, we had talked about actually at the Theology After Google conference. How is information changing? How is religion changing because of this democratization? Really interested in that. Wednesdays, I was going to interview an author every Wednesday. Thursdays, have a book review. So I'd be doing a book review every Thursday. And on Fridays, I would have Twibel commentary. So whatever I was doing in the Twibel and tweeting, I would then write about on the site. So it was a really good plan. And you know Mormons love to have a plan. And then, oh, first I should say, the blogs that I followed at the time, and I really modeled my blog after, one of them was the Jesus Creed by Scott McKnight. If you've heard of him, he's an evangelical blogger. I swear the man does not sleep because he's blogging three or four times a day. 
but which I cannot do. Uh, his kids are grown and out of the house. But the way that he has managed to build a community has been very impressive to me. And then another one is Emergent Village Voice, which, is, which like By Common Consent, is a group blog, so very different from what I was doing, but still taking on a lot of the same ideas. I followed also Beyond Blue, which is a, a belief net site about religion and mental illness, but that was one done by one person, and then By Common Consent was my, my favorite in the blogger knackle. But this is what it really looked like. So you have this plan, and you're going to do this on Monday, and you're going to do this on Wednesday, and then actually this is how it turns out, because there's news, there's uh, stuff going on in your life, and so blogging did not turn out the way that I had expected in terms of the schedule. It takes up a tremendous amount of time and energy, which I didn't quite appreciate when I accepted the job. I wanted to focus on two posts that I wrote in that first year that I was blogging that had very different reactions. This first one was in the end of September of 2010. I ran a Q&A with David Beckman, who is the president of Bread for the World, and at that time, in the fall of 2010, was about to receive the World Food Prize. It's basically the Nobel Prize for hunger, and he was sharing this prize with the president of the Heifer Project International. Big deal, right? I mean, this is major, major deal. And he was reporting some very optimistic news that we used to have 55,000 children starving to death every day. Now we have 26,000. That is still horrible and tragic. But we have halved that particular kind of poverty in the world. So the reaction to this post, we had 10 Facebook shares. Oh, that's OK. That's OK, just leave it. The point was nobody read it. I don't even know if there were any comments on that post. Nobody read it. Nobody cared. And the next week, I blogged about Boyd K. Packer and his talk about homosexuality. Firestorm, major controversy, mail, hate mail, love mail, every kind of mail. It was crazy, absolutely crazy at the beginning of October because I had openly disagreed with a general authority about a social issue that the church had deemed to be very important. I did it, I think, respectfully. I never personalized it. I did not question his authority as a, as a member of the Quorum of the Twelve. I disagreed, and I had reasons that I expressed in the blog for disagreeing. And some of the comments were interesting. So I, you see here, 4,812 shares on Facebook, 88 tweets, and I don't know how many comments because I stopped reading them. Very, very predictably, the comments come along two lines. Next. Someone says, who are you to be writing this post? You're not an apostle. The prophet has spoken. Shut up. Someone else says, thank you so much for saying this. My son is gay. We've had so much pain. Then person number one or thread number one just goes on. And you, it's so predictable. The, the discussion, they're just talking past each other or more likely yelling past each other. And it's not terribly constructive dialogue. One of the things that I'm trying to accomplish as a blogger is to create a safe space for people to talk. And this doesn't help when people are demonizing each other and me about issues. OK, so the other thing that's going on, right at this precise time, can you pass the water? Thanks. So right at this precise time, uh, at the end of September, beginning of October 2010, I got the news that a friend of mine, a good friend from high school, had just committed suicide. And so <clears throat> that's on my mind. I go to church the Sunday after that happened, and the Boyd K. Packer blog post happened. And, you know, I was very sad and upset, and I think because nobody knew about my friend, I think they assumed that I was sad because of the response that they saw on my blog. So one of the women in my ward came up to me in the parking lot and gave me a hug and said, you know, I completely disagree with you, but I'm so sorry about those comments. They don't know you. They don't know who you are. 
And then I went into the church, and a member of my bishopric, who is you know, diehard Republican, loves to talk about politics, watches Fox News every day, gave me a hug and said, Sister Reese, I feel prompted to tell you that we love you so much, and we are so glad you're in our war. And the contrast between the love and acceptance that I felt with people face to face and the hatred that was manifested on this blog was very palpable to me. I started to get pretty depressed about the possibility that it could even happen that you could create a good safe space for dialogue online. Next. So in October, let's see, about a week after the Boyd K. Packer post went up, maybe 10 days, I got a call. If you've read Flunking Sainthood, this is the epilogue of the book, Shock of My Adult Life. The father who had abandoned our family when I was 14 shows up in a hospital in Mobile, Alabama. They called me on a Wednesday afternoon and said, we have an indigent patient. He has no family. He has no one. Will you come? So that's what I'm dealing with. And it starts this, this time in my life between my friends, suicide, this kind of hate fest that I was feeling online, and this completely unexpected family event. Not a great time for me. So this is my dad. I don't put this up here to shock you, but just to show you how shocked I was at this time. This is what I'm dealing with going down to Alabama to see this person I haven't seen since I was a teenage girl, dying in a hospital, looking completely different from the person that I remembered. And so I posted on my blog, due to a death in the family, flunking sainthood is on hiatus for two weeks, gave the time that I would return, and thanked the people who had reached out with condolences. Maybe they'd heard about it on Facebook. Next. The first or second comment I get is this one. I'm sure you mean that due to me being brought up on charges in LDS church court, I won't be posting for at least two weeks. Is that what you meant to write? Josh. Next. Classy. <laughs> Next. My feelings. In order, the first is just shock. I can't believe that someone would say that. Who would say that when someone has lost a family member? I said, due to a death in the family. Wow. Anger. Oh my gosh, I may be flunking sainthood buster, but you totally flunked sunbeams. <laughs> what in the world? Next. And then finally evolving into this, this deep sadness about what kind of people are we? What kind of church are we? that we would form a person who, instead of mourning with those who mourn, comforting those who stand in need of comfort, would do that. Really, what kind of church are we that we could make such a person? Next. So I wanted to share with you my coping mechanism for this. I like to rewrite the uh, lyrics to primary songs with really mean and nasty <laughs> lyrics which I don't usually share with anyone, but I find them to be really helpful. So I'm not going to sing this for you, but I'm trying to be like Jesus. I'm following in his way, but Jesus would want to smack you for all the cruel things you say. Oh, and I have others. I have many others. I work in primary, and sometimes those little primary scripts are going through my mind. So, you know, I have a lot of coping mechanisms. This one is a humorous one. But I'm still upset about the sort of the level, the tenor of this discourse. Next. Okay, I'd like to fast forward to the beginning of this year and just explain a little bit about where my blog is now. I was with BeliefNet. You see BeliefNet here on the left. And <clears throat> I don't know if you can kind of see these things. These are more from BeliefNet and it talks about things that you can do for your health and things you can do to lose your belly fat and you know, lots of stuff that increasingly just doesn't have anything to do with religion. BeliefNet changed a great deal from the time that I started there 
In fact, two weeks after I started in June 2010, they laid off half their staff. And it was just one of those sort of media purges that happens and is happening more frequently. But it was a, sort of a difficult time, and a lot of BeliefNet bloggers were jumping ship. Is there someone here from Patheos? Yep, yep. A lot of them went to Patheos, including Scott McKnight and Rod Dreher and, you know, some good people. But my, my lowest moment came when they wanted me to blog about Lindsay Lohan. So that's why Lindsay is up here. Um, we, we would get these weekly keyword, sort of trending topic newsletters from BeliefNet. And Lindsay Lohan was consistently in the news at this time. And my lowest moment happened to be when she was you know, out of court or in court for something. And then I got this thing from BeliefNet about her underwear. Really? They want me to blog about Lindsay's underwear or lack thereof? I don't think so. Right, lack thereof. I'm like, what does this have to do with religion? So I get a call from Religion News Service, which is an organization I really respect. And by the way, I should say BeliefNet was very good to me. I mean, just believing me in me and giving me the start. But none of the people that helped me start at BeliefNet were there anymore. Um, RNS, though, had reached out to me, and I liked the idea of being able to blog in a more substantive way, you know, for a news service that cares about journalistic integrity, that cares about having a measured tone, and is not going to ask me to blog about Lindsay's underwear. Next. Another thing that happened at BeliefNet was when it was time to, to redesign the blog headers for all of the bloggers, this is what they sent me. So they w I, I think that they just thought, well, Mormon woman, pink roses, Book of Mormon, it's perfect. You know, and the, the designer had clearly not read the blog, which can sometimes be a little edgy, can sometimes be, um, you know, I hope it's measured and substantive, but it's not uncritical. So I wrote back in what was a an admirably restrained email and said, first of all, you can't use the Book of Mormon image for any kind of commercial enterprise. You can't have the Book of Mormon right above an ad to lose your belly fat. Mormons will not go for that. But even more than, what is with the roses? What is that about? You know, the blog is, is not this sort of saccharine sugary place. So I switched. Next. I wanted to close with five rules that I have hit upon in kind of the trial and error of blogging and doing this five times a week, at least ideally five times a week, over the last couple of years. The first one, wait, think, read, pray. If you read my blog, you might have noticed that I'm never the first person jumping in on a topic. Uh, for example, next week I'm having a blog post about the City Creek Mall, which everyone else is completely over and is no longer in the news. But I felt strongly that I didn't want to just dive in and talk about something until I'd been able to read about it, look at several different sides of the story, and also to visit it since I knew I was coming here to Utah. So I went on Tuesday to the City Creek Mall and sat there and finished my post while I was sitting there. I think it's important that we take the time to really do some research, take a breath. Blogging can be a very passionate enterprise, and sometimes people can say things very easily that they regret. Digital is forever. If you're a blogger, you can go back in, you can change your words, but some version of that earlier thing is always going to be out there. Think before you blog, and pray. Pray is really important. Next. Never demonize those with different views. Ever since the Glenn Beck post, when I kind of did that, I have tried very carefully not to demonize people I disagree with. Because I know what it feels like to be on the receiving end of that, and I tell you, it does not feel good to have people who, who don't know me, who've never met me, assume that they know everything about me because of one thing that they know, which is maybe that I'm Mormon or that I'm a liberal Mormon, uh, and nothing else. So don't demonize those with other views. Next, build community. This is something I take really seriously on my blog. Right now on RNS, it's not very comment enabled. So because they are a journalistic uh, 
enterprise. It's important to them that people who comment on the blog actually sign in with their names. And the result of that is that like nobody comments. And so right now the building community part is a little bit harder than it used to be at BeliefNet, but I don't have people writing in as iron rod telling me that I'll be in outer darkness sometime soon. <laughs> so it's a bit of a trade-off. Next. Keep blogging about important topics even if nobody cares. I'm going to keep blogging about world hunger even if I have zero Facebook shares. It's hugely important to me. Next. And finally, take reg regular digital Sabbaths. This is something that I started doing when I was doing Flunking Sainthood, and it turned out to be such a liberating, transformative practice that I started implementing it into my regular life. So starting on Saturday night around 9 p.m. until Monday morning around 9 a.m., I just don't go near my computer. I don't check Facebook. I don't check email. If you try to contact me in that time, don't be offended that I don't get back to you for a couple days. But having those 36 hours away from being glued to this screen gives me a kind of perspective and, and a kind of graceful looking at the world that I wouldn't have otherwise if I were just constantly keyed in. Next. Finally, one of my favorite quotes, be the change you wish to see in the world. You know, we had a fantastic talk last night about peacemaking in the Mormon tradition. It was one of the best talks I've ever heard within Mormonism. And what was that? Nope. I think that if we want to change how dialogue happens on the internet, we need to model that. I'm trying to do that on my blog. I'm trying not to demonize, you know, trying not to stereotype. Be the change that we want to see in the world. If we want change to happen, we can write about the issues that we are passionate about, and we can do it in a Christ-like way. Thank you. And now Christine will dance. This may take a minute. No idea what program we're in or how to get out of it. You know what? Let's not do it. It's really not that important. Let's skip it. Okay. All right. Visual aids later if you really want to see them. I'm just going to talk. So uh, from my melodramatic title, you might surmise that I'm going to say serious things about mommy blogs and that they might not be entirely nicey-nice things. Um, this is, in fact, what I had planned, but as I was getting ready to fly out here, I had a crisis of confidence and started feeling a little bit silly approaching pictures of cute kids and recipes as opportunities for earnest moralizing. Um, also in preparation for leaving home, I was doing loads and loads of laundry so that my children would at least have clean underwear if anyone reminded them to put it on. So um, I decided I would talk a little bit about laundry. Um, my grandmother remembers wash day in her small town um, Utah home as a weekly occasion for cutthroat competition. Um, this may say more about my grandmother than the town, I'm not sure. Um, every family would race to be the first to have their laundry out on the line. So everyone's industry, organization, wealth, and even some more intimate details of their household were displayed for all to see every Monday morning or afternoon for the slow pokes. Um, long after she had grown up and left small town Utah for the Midwest and then Washington, D.C., and even after she had washing machines, um, her first one, she explained to me, was also a dishwasher. Like it had two different insides and you would take out the wash tub and put it in the dishwasher. I, I thought it was really cool. Um, anyway, um, even she always did her laundry on Mondays. Even with 11 children, she accomplished this task in a way that reinforced her sense of herself as an efficient and admirable homemaker, a stalwart member of the community, not someone whose laundry might not get finished on the first day of the week. A generation later, my own mother always had a washing machine and usually used a dryer as well. Um, she also had a residual cultural sense, though she didn't grow up Mormon, that Monday was wash day. It wasn't executed perfectly every week, and as we got older, she made us do our own laundry on other assigned days, but Monday was still perceived as the right day to do the laundry, all caps. Um, I had the sense that many, though not all, of my friends' mothers also did laundry on Monday, and my own sense that this was the right way was reinforced by perusing books like Daryl Houle's The Joy of Homemaking, 
which I read when I was 10 after it was given to my mother as a gift and she threw it across the room in annoyance. I figured it had to be good. Um, unfortunately, this early exposure seems to have had the effect of making me enjoy reading books about housekeeping more than actually doing it. Um, so now, a few decades later, I find myself tossing in loads of wash at midnight on a regular basis in my lonely laundry room. I can't ever remember talking about laundry day with any of my friends, and I don't even feel bad about not doing my laundry on Monday. Although, I did feel bad when my then seven-year-old son asked to tell for a um, primary program in church um, about a time when he had displayed the virtue of courage, said, I show courage when I have to go down to the basement to get clean clothes because my mom doesn't take them out of the dryer. <laughs> <laughs> Still, even the minimal residue of knowing it's laundry day, of laundry and other tasks of housewifery as communal undertakings, is really lost to me in my experience. Um, mommy blogs, in some ways, recapture this communal sense of housemaking and child re rearing as something that, that we're all engaged in together. They put the laundry back out on the line, as it were. They make the ordinary work of Mormon women's lives, child care, cooking, cleaning, entertaining, volunteer work at church and school, craft and art, visible. In this way, they are a profoundly feminist project, insisting that women's lives and women's work are worth paying attention to. In um, her Primer for Daily Life, uh, Marxist feminist Susan Willis noted that, um, in assessing the work of the women's movement in Britain, a women's studies group at the University of Birmingham found that, quote, the early writings of the current women's movement concentrated on the articulation of the experience of housework. The concern was primarily to bring visibility to women's work in the home and to have it recognized as work. Willis goes on to discuss the distinctions between use value and exchange value and notes that activities with only use value, that is most of the things that homemakers do, simply don't count in capitalist economies except when that work itself can be commodified, as in the production of, you guessed it, clean laundry. Um, she says, those piles of laundered clothes awaiting the children who will put them away in drawers and closets, she doesn't know my children, are a little different from the cans of peas on the supermarket shelf. Both exemplify the erasure of the labor and social relations that go into their production. It is striking how commodity capitalism then finds way to reintroduce the presence of lost labor, for instance, there is a line of products marketed to render use value perceptible. These are the fresh scents and static free sheets that the housewife can buy in order to put appreciable traces, traces of her care and labor into her laundry. This is a commodity culture's response to the absolute impossibility of demonstrating the social nature of use value. So, mommy blogs are about cute kids and women's work. They give women a voice and insist to the world that the things women think about are important. How and why? would we want to critique them? Let me count the ways. Um, <laughs> they participate in the commodification of women's work and in the perpetuation of the notion that homemaking consists essentially of consumption. Many monomy blogs are money-making endeavors with various forms of advertising, including sponsored content in which the voices of women are co-opted to market products. What might be an important mode of asserting the spiritual value or the personal experience of mothering becomes an exercise in branding. And I had a, a picture from a Mormon mommy blog that had an adorable photo of a two-year-old girl with curly hair reading Green Eggs and Ham in French. Unbelievably cute. And then at the bottom, it had the Clorox logo. And it said, this is, um, I'm um, using Clorox products to simplify my house cleaning so I have more time to read to my child. And time is really valuable, and it tried to have the spiritual, it was <laughs> very jarring. Um, they also reduce family life to a visual phenomenon. This is, of course, part of what makes them value appealing to advertisers who've known for a long time that pi pictures speak more loudly than words and that using images to suggest a lifestyle rather than trying to precisely enumerate the merits of their products is an effective way of getting people not to notice that they may, in fact, be acting against their own ideals and best interests as the desire for a particular pl product is carefully implanted. Um, there isn't really time to explore this question here, but I want to sort of note for future work the possibility that this rendering of women's work and the women who do it as spectacle is part of what enables and fuels the current obsession with women's bodies that manifests itself as discourse about modesty in the church. What used to be a social value directed at the creation of particular kinds of community, that is, modesty as seemliness, a proper sense of public decorum and private virtue, is reduced to an insistence on women constructing themselves as appropriate objects of the usually male patriarchal gaze. Um, there is even a subgenre of mommy blogs devoted to modest fashion. Um, there are a lot of them, actually. Um, 
and the, the post I had was one on um, wearing uh, modest length skirts without appearing frumpy. Um, so um, they not only, these blogs not only construct family life as a spectacle for visitors to blogs, but even for the producers of the blogs themselves. The mother who is documenting her family's life as a means either of self-expression or to generate income will at least sometimes experience her own life at one remove, thus reenacting the posture of ironic detachment of the postmodern that mommy blogs seem in part intended to resist. Um, this, of course, is happening to all of us, whether we write mommy blogs or not. Um, yesterday I was talking to my daughter on the phone and I said my standard goodbye of I love you to the moon and back, and she said, I love you to the last digit of pi. <laughs> and I was, of course, touched and very proud of my little girl for learning mathematics. And, um, and then an alarmingly short moment later, I thought, I can't wait to put that on my Facebook status. <laughs> It's awful. So, um, so that happens, and I think it's something to watch out for. Um, the most important critique, though, I think, is that Mormon mommy blogs are almost indistinguishable from other mommy blogs. Mormon mommy blogging is mostly not evidence of spiritual conviction, but of lifestyle choice. Um, here's an excerpt from a Salon article last year or the year before extolling the delights of Mormon mommy blogs. This was written by um, a young... 20-something um, um, New York woman who described herself as a cheerful agnostic um, who could not stop reading Mormon mommy blogs. She said she was addicted. She says, at first glance, Naomi and Stacy and Stephanie and Liz appear to be members of the species known as the hipster mommy blogger, though perhaps a bit more cheerful and wholesome than most. They have bangs like Zoe Deschanel and closets full of cool vintage dresses. Their houses look like anthropology catalogs. Their kids look like baby Gap models. Their husbands look like young graphic designers, all cute lumberjack shirts and square-framed glasses. They spend their days doing fun craft projects. Vintagey owl throw pillow, recycled button earrings, hand-stamped linen napkins. They spend their weekends throwing big, whimsical dinner parties for their friends, all of whom have equally adorable kids and husbands. But as you page through their blog archives, you notice certain tells. They're super young, like four kids at 29 young. They mention relatives in Utah. They drink a suspicious amount of hot chocolate. <laughs> Finally, you see it, a subtly placed widget with a picture of a temple or a hyperlink on the word faith or belief. You click the link and up pops the official website of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Uh, the even more extreme manifestation of this focus on the visual representation of lifestyle is, of course, Pinterest, which is becoming very popular among Mormon women. Um, there, there's even less text, less discussion, less uncomfortable dissent than on highly pictorial Mormon mommy blogs, and there are no distinctions between devotional texts and photos and recipes and favorite items from catalogs. Everything is flattened into a visual, visual simulacrum of uncomplicated wholesomeness. It's a very cheerful Babylon. Um, the church has been entirely, um, well, the church has been quite successful in making one particular form of family life the central commitment of Mormons. But unlike, say, conservative, conservative ed evangelical Christians who wrote the Prairie Muff Muffin Manifesto, and that's a slide I really should have, but um, they have this, this carefully articulated resistance to notions of modernity. So women should wear skirts, women should have as many children as they can, um, women should um, read Laura Ingalls Wilder with caution because she is a bit of a proto-feminist. Um, but it's this very carefully ideologically articulated resistance to, um, to modern feminism. And, and Mormon women don't have a, a Mormon equivalent of that. Our, um, they don't have a particularly Mormon rationale for their choices. Mormon women are encouraged to be educated and in most ways to participate in modern economies and social structures. And one not mommy blogger all too aptly described Mormon rhetoric about male headship as chicken patriarchy. Um, what Mormon mommy blogs demonstrate is not so much religious commitment to homemaking as an embrace of American consumer culture and Generation Y commitment to self-expression. Mormonism is part of these bloggers' personal brand to the extent that their chosen lifestyles mirror the post-70s LDS commitment to a particular family form. Um, note that in the excerpt above, information about Mormonism is found in a subtly placed widget or a hyperlink on some innocuous term like faith. Um, what this similarity with other lifestyle blogs might suggest is that Mormons are at a moment of relatively low tension with the surrounding society, or at least they were until um, Brother Romney began his political <laughs> career. Um, 
This lack of um, optimal tension with the surrounding society allows differences between Mormons to arise, as in the 1960s when Armand Moss notes the variation in Mormon political conviction. But without clearly divine, defined external threats, um, circling the wagons will inevitably draw circles that exclude some self-identified group members. Gender roles turn out to be an imperfect boundary maintenance issue because varied compliance with ideal gender roles creates internal divisions. Um, However, lacking the theological and communitarian elements of resistance to American modernity, um, this increasingly public domesticity may lack the ideological underpinning to really create boundaries for Mormons. The confusion over the theological justification for valorizing stay-at-home motherhood is evident in the divided sphere of women's personal writings. Just a couple examples of the confusion. Um, here's a, a quotation from a mommy blog, um, a really famous big mommy blog. She says, I'm not a feminist because I don't support, look fondly on, hope for, or work towards equality. Equality, that's my hang up. Equality has never done any good for me. When I try to look at the world with my equalizer glasses, it leaves me empty, up, empty and upset. Equality presents a scale and binds you. And life is not fair, so how can it be equal? But even if it could, I don't want to be equal to the males in my life. I just want to be me. If that means I'm more, then I'm more. If that means I'm less, I'm less. But most of the time, I think I'm more, and I think most women are too. Or here's from another blog. Um, basically, I don't choose to use the term feminism for myself because the term daughter of God suffices, more than suffices, to produce something inside of me that is ultimately commanding. And to that end, I also believe that any woman who was, has been, or will be inspired to bring about the betterment of female life was also directed by God. I acknowledge the efforts made by these women, tough decisions and radical thinking, and for the good they have done. I believe they were inspired by personal and powerful revelation, not feminism per se. Ultimately, I believe being a Mormon female, along with all the covenants, promises, and oaths I have made, supersedes the feminism agenda. And sometimes I worry that if my fellow saints get too engaged in what is and what isn't a Mormon feminist, they miss the whole glory of being a Mormon woman. So thus, while engaged in what would have passed for feminist activism a few decades ago, um, these bloggers often explicitly eschew the label feminism and regard themselves as resisting feminist ideologies. In this uneasy and selective embrace of contemporary social mores, mom mommy bloggers are performing an important part of Mormonism's awkward dance with its host culture. Since its 20th century emergence from isolation, um, Mormonism has generally embraced the technologies and economies of its host society. Doctrinally, if not always culturally, Mormonism welcomes advances in knowledge from science and medicine, and even occasionally from the social sciences and humanities, and cautiously from the arts. Um, but this em embrace of modernity and reasonably comfortable assimilation is a dance that has always been choreographed by gender. In the early days of the church, men and women bore the burden of tension and separateness, what Armin Moss calls the predicament of disrepute, pretty equally. Men sacrificed careers and money to go on missions and settle colonies. They were encouraged to participate in the cooperative and frequently shaky economy of the saints. They had to go into hiding to avoid prosecution for religious belief and practices that set them apart. After Utah statehood and the abandonment of polygamy, though, as theocratic government and cooperative economic ventures were gradually abandoned, Mormon men's lives began to more closely resemble those of their peers in the rest of the country. Mormon women's lives changed, too, but for some decades they retained notable political and economic power, um, at least the women who were not left destitute by the dissolution of their polygamous families. And their experience in independence they cultivated in the years when their menfolk were away on missions, busy colonizing the territory of Utah and struggling to support large polygamous, polygamous families, had given them roles in the community that were more expansive than many Mormon women's, I mean many American women's who are not Mormon. Um, in a slow, sad, complex process that played out until mid-century, however, the Relief Society and Mormon women gradually ceded both ecclesiastical and economic power, and Mormon women's lives also began to resemble those of their suburban American counterparts devoted to housewifery and child rearing. In the late 50s and 60s, er, Mormon lives were probably as similar to other Americans' um, lives as they have ever been, and it is this moment that we've chosen to reify as the essence of Mormon life with the unfortunate result that we have also allowed the definition of homemaker as consumer in chief to permeate our collective sense of what families should be like. We've concentrated too much on a demographic ideal that is achievable for a relatively small fraction of affluent Western saints and then valorized that ideal to such a degree that people who either don't accept or can't achieve that particular form of family life 
feel that their families are wrong or that they don't belong in the church since it is a church about families. Young women who don't like cupcakes and aprons, to be grossly reductive, sorry, um, may feel that their life goals are incompatible with continued participation in the church. The fact that all of these tensions remain unspoken and that the enforcement of these ideals is largely cultural rather than doctrinal means that the necessary work of maintaining Mormon distinctiveness is left to women, and they have, as one would expect from people devoted and loyal to the church, tried to police these boundaries among themselves, despite receiving very little guidance and some of that contradictory from the hierarchy. The closest thing we have to a canonical iteration of ideals about family life is, of course, the Proclamation on the Family, which is a French post-structuralist dream text in its capacity to mean precisely opposite things to people inclined to interpret it differently. <laughs> um, <laughs> It says, as you know, by divine design, fathers are to preside over their families in love and righteousness and are responsible to provide the necessities of life and protection for their families. Mothers are primarily responsible for the nurture of their children. In these sacred responsibilities, fathers and mothers are obligated to help one another as equal partners. Um, disability, death, or other circumstances may necessitate individual adaptation, which is an elastic clause big enough to drive um, large trucks through. Um, our conditioning to focus on the forms of family life rather than the content sometimes creates deep divisions among Mormon women who enact the larger culture's mommy wars with particular ferocity because each side is convinced that God is on their side. Uh, an unfortunate illustration was the reception of Relief Society President Julie Beck's talk entitled Mothers Who Know. Mormon feminists and even many vaguely I'm not a feminist but types of Mormon women responded quickly and vehemently to her words, but even more I'm convinced to the pictures that were chosen, probably not by her, to illustrate her talk in the broadcast media version of the talk. Almost all of these pictures portrayed mothers involved in housekeeping tasks with small children. Mormon feminists reacted as though she had just reiterated President Benson's talk to the mothers in Zion, which explicitly enjoined women to quit their jobs, their secretarial and cafe working job, um, or risk spiritual peril for their families. Um, in fact, Beck's talk criticized the over-involved parenting style of a certain stripe of wealthy, high-achieving stay-at-home mothers as detrimental to real spiritual health of families, at the same time as she encouraged mothers to prioritize the nurture and education of their children. It was a problematic talk to be sure, but its nuance and wisdom were completely lost in part because we are all trained to interpret semiotic signals about family in habitual modes that are intellectually calcified and emotionally brittle. Ironically, the world of Mormon blogs to which many look for an escape from the most entrenched aspects of Mormon culture very neatly reproduces and even amplifies this unfortunate gender division and the divorce of material from spiritual and intellectual culture. As Patrick pointed out yesterday, uh, the big mom Mormon blogs are largely dominated by male voices, with the exceptions being feminist Mormon housewives, the exponent, and Segula, which largely reproduce the separate spheres of the Victorian manner. When By Common Consent did what was supposed to be a lighthearted poll of topics readers were sick of discussing, women's issues won by a landslide and elicited disdainful comments about women's whining, their obsession with boring topics and babies' poop, their unrighteous craving for ecclesiastical power, and their craven, selfish desire to have it all which, being interpreted, is wanting to have choices about their life's work and still be considered good parents, have a voice in decisions about church policy that affect their lives and church service, and be able to consecrate their spiritual gifts to the church without having those gifts rejected or limited by their gender. A constellation of privileges that sounds rather exactly like that which the men who condemned their selfishness enjoy regularly. Um, there are episodic rhetorical battles about whether or not mommy blogs can be considered part of the blogger knuckle or whether or not denizens of the blogger knuckle should be considered apostate. Like academic politics, these battles are especially fierce because the stakes are so low. Um, <laughs> or maybe they're not. Um, Charles Baudrillard famously asserted that in postmodern culture, the simulacrum is truth. While the quotidian contentions of defining Mormonism in the virtual realm are likely insignificant, it is possible to read a great deal about Mormon assimilation from the shiny screens of the mommy blogs. While Americans are distrustful of Mormon temple ritual and the insistence on secrecy that is all but incomprehensible in an age when Twitter lets everyone know what everyone else is doing all the time, Mormon home life, which is rightly understood as the instantiation in secular space of the ideals and aspirations of the temple, is becoming increasingly public. It remains to be seen whether the trend towards being just like everyone else, only cuter, <laughs> will continue, whether women's work will become increasingly invisible while the products of that work are packaged as visual commodities, or whether the salvific work of creating Mormon homes in a variety of forms will continue to be understood as transcending its visual representation. 
For Latter-day Saints, the happy virtual consumerism of cyberspace represents a real threat. Mormon doctrine insists that spirit and matter cannot be separated. The simulacrum cannot be truth. Mormon grace and salvation are mediated through community and through the physical performance of sacraments. Mormonism, Mormons aim to live in a God-haunted world, and the possibility of the enchantment of cyberspace seems as yet uncertain. <laughs>